Well, good morning and uh, welcome to our second day of Idea Stream. Uh, it's great to have you all here uh, virtually. Um, uh, I wish I could see you in person, but hopefully a year from now we'll be able to do that. Uh, yesterday, if you were here yesterday, we covered a lot of our health and medical projects, and today we're going to move across to physical sciences. Uh, great program yesterday, um, but I'll be repeating some of the things I said. This is our 20th idea stream. Um, and again, welcome to all of you. Some of you are new to idea stream and some have been coming for many, many years and certainly hope you enjoy the day. If you miss any of the program and um, want to watch it later, or if you weren't here yesterday, you'd like to see some of yesterday's program, we will have a recording available um, on our website in about a week or so. So check back in roughly a week and, and you should be able to see a recording. Uh, the weather today in Boston is kind of overcast, but cloudy. Yesterday was a nice sunny day and uh, we're expecting a big rainstorm coming in uh, tonight. So fortunately, it's not cold enough to snow, but hopefully wherever you are in the world, the weather is really good. You know, it takes um, money to put on these events. And um, I'd like to thank our event sponsors for really underwriting IdeaStream. And they are Gunderson Detmo, Dow, and Hamamatsu. We really appreciate your support. Um, in the background, we have our AV team from Studio 125, Laird, Monica, and Keith, working a lot of their magic so that this show goes smoothly. And I'd also like to thank the Deshpande Center team of Shirley, Karen, and Eric, who've put a lot of work into making this um, event very, very, very uh, powerful and helping it run smoothly. Our speaker bios and agenda can be found at the IdeaStream website, ideastream.mit.edu. So we're going to start today with a, a panel on fundraising for physical science startups um, with Jamie Goldstein and Matthew Norden. Jamie's been a founder and CEO of many startup companies and also 
venture investor in several, quite a lot actually, deep technology companies. Um, and Matthew has started companies and is also a venture investor focusing mainly in the clean tech area. So let's invite uh, our panelists, Jamie and Matthew to join us. Okay, welcome, Jamie. Welcome, Matthew. Good to see you guys. Nice um, to be here. And, you know, Jamie nice and Matthew have both been involved with the Deshpande Center as our panelist mentors for quite a long time. So let's, um, let's now look at, at some of the issues that are going on in fundraising for deep tech startups. And what we see, it seems like from the outside, it seems like there's actually quite a lot of money available. It seems to be a good time to raise money um, for companies, but you guys are, are right in the mix there. So let's kick off with Jamie. Um, what are you seeing in the current fundraising environment for um, deep tech startups? Sure, Leon, thank you for having me. So. Uh, the venture capital industry set records for year 2020 and uh, set new records in the first quarter of 2021. So there's venture capital funding like it's never been before. Uh, there's a lot of problems in the world and uh, and university research plays a strong role in, in helping create the innovation there. Uh, luckily, there's a lot of firms now that are focused on these areas, tough tech and climate. Matthew's going to talk a lot about that. And um, and I know this is a sort of a, a physical sciences panel, but I'll point out that there's a lot of software companies that come out of research based startups as well in our own portfolio. You know, companies like Algorand and Neuromagic and Path AI are all software companies that came out of this kind of research. So I think it's a phenomenal time to be thinking about commercializing uh, these technologies. Right. And, you know, Matthew, what, what we're seeing here, I know you focus a lot in the, in the sort of clean tech, green tech area. It almost reminds me of, um, you know, 20 years ago when we had the dot-com bubble and the internet bubble and the, and the um, sort of communications bubble. There's a lot of money flowing into that area. Um, the government is going to put a lot of money and seems to be, you know, classic bubble situation. but um, Probably a great time to raise money. I'd love to get your perspective on it. Yeah, I think if you're an entrepreneur with a climate tech proposition and you believe there is a God, she wants you to raise money right now. Uh, absolutely right time, right place. I think in some ways it can be a little dangerous. You know, there was a flirtation that Silicon Valley had with what was then called clean tech in the early 2000s. It kind of ended in tears, you know, lots of money deployed, lots of copycat companies got started, more than 200 in FinFilm Solar alone, uh, that was kind of uh, doomed to fail from the outset. I do think things are pretty different now. I think if you look at the investors in climate tech uh, 10 years ago, those were mostly kind of rebadged uh, IT and biotech investors who were kind of coming up a learning curve really fast on industrial categories they might not have known very well. Most of the firms now are more purpose-built. Ours certainly is. Our team is majority PhD scientist. Um, I think there was a lot of dependence on government at that time uh, and a thought that there would be a price on carbon that would kind of make everything magically work economically. I don't think anyone suffers under that delusion right now. And, you know, companies like the research-based founders that are, you know, listening to us today are really building value propositions that don't depend on pricing or subsidy support. And I also think the macro is better. I mean, when you have now, what, 40% uh, of the Fortune 1000 that have made climate neutral or climate negative pledges, in some cases with billions of dollars committed over a short amount of time, you know, Microsoft, Google, Apple, others, uh, it really is a different landscape, but it pays to be careful. Okay. So it sounds like I'm hearing from both of you, this is actually a good time to be... Um, you know, a founder raising money. This is not one of those drought years where, there's, where it's hard to do so. So, um, you know, what can a founder do? What can the founders do to really build value before they go out and try and raise money? And uh, Jamie, do you want to take that one initially? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So there's a resource on our website I'd love to point people to. 
uh, on the Pillar uh, VC website called the Founder Playlist, which has a tremendous amount of content. But to just try to keep it tight here, I'll reference a, a document my, my colleague Russ Wilcox, a founder of E-Inc, an MIT spinout, wrote about how to create value in your company before you raise money. And, uh, and so one of the things you can do, first of all, is to recruit your team, find your co-founders, your advisors, board members, luminaries that you can add into the story to make it more credible. You can get an option to the license uh, of the intellectual property that you want to uh, form your company around. And of course, you want to spend a lot of time talking to customers. Very much, uh, you know, a lot of these research startups are sort of a, a hammer looking for nail or many nails. And I think the key in these early stages is to try to narrow the focus of what you're building so that you can uh, get to revenue quickly. Of course, there's still a giant opportunity beyond that, but to the extent you can have a narrow executable story on a reasonable amount of capital, you have created value without ever raising any money. Okay, great. And Matthew, uh, your thoughts on what founders could do really before they go out and start looking for money. Yeah, Jamie's points were all great. Um, I think in our field of climate tech, uh, the big thing is to demonstrate the fundamental techno-economic entitlement. So the fundamental scientific principle that shows that you're going to be better, faster, cheaper uh, in a way that's not ambiguous and can be clearly understood by investors. Uh, there's a company that we funded called Verdox that's out of MIT, uh, out of Alan Hatton's lab. The technical founder is a brilliant guy named Sahag Baskin. And he, he did two things that we've talked about here. Number one, before he went out and raised money on a proposition that could have gone in a lot of different ways, he found an extraordinary business co-founder who had been there and done that and built companies beforehand. And the second is that they had a very clear and easily understandable, you know, not buried on page four of a, you know, scientific journal article explication of here is why this is fundamentally lower cost and can fundamentally outcompete other approaches in a way that was easy to understand. That alone transformed how they approached fundraising. Okay, right. So you guys, you guys see a lot of um, obviously presentations from invest from uh, founders rather. Um, you know, you, you're looking at tons and tons of these. What are the top three things that as investors you look for Matthew why don't you continue with some then we'll switch to Jamie so, so it's hard to talk about a top three things because the top three things well, maybe are go, if insane. you want to go beyond three you can go beyond three. yeah well the joke right is the top three would be the same thing it would be people people and people um yeah. in many ways early stage venture investors are not so much investors with a capital I we're talent scouts with a checkbook and everything's going to change. The business plan is going to pivot. Um, nothing's going to go the way the team expects. The deck is like a good way to have a conversation with a founder about how they think about things and approach problems, but it's not a prediction of the future. What's not going to change is the people who are involved, or if it does, something's gone terribly wrong. Uh, so I think really getting to know people, being able to crisply tell a story on the page and in person of who you are, why you're qualified, and you know why you think this is going to change the world is a really big deal. After that, I would say number two and three for us to beat a dead horse a little bit are fundamental techno-economic entitlement. Uh, and then third, the you know why this is not just different, but on what dimension is it extraordinary? And if we see something that's kind of interesting on a lot of fronts and you know competitive on a bunch, but there's no one axis where it just blows the roof off, uh, you know, it tends not to bubble to the top of our investment pipeline. And, and, and Jamie, I see a lot of head nodding there. Um, well, no yes, uh, Matthew, Matthew uh, inadvertently stole my line. I think it's right. It's it's all about the people. <laughs> I think early stage VCs, it's got to be eighty or ninety percent of the decision. I, I think people don't really uh, fully understand that. Um, but the other thing that, that a founder should remember is that you know most VC firms are going to do somewhere between a half a dozen and a dozen deals a year, and so. It's not always the question of like, could you make money on your project? Is this the best place the investors should spend their time and effort uh, and capital? And so sort of mirroring what Matthew said, like, why can this be extraordinary? Investors are, are typically looking for an investment in a company that can return their entire fund. And so if they're managing many tens or hundreds of millions of dollars, that has to be an extraordinary outcome. And so you have to make them understand that that it has the capability to be that. 
Right. So, you know, you, you mentioned typical fund might invest in, you know, single digit number of deals in a year. Um, so it's a small number. Let's look at this from the other side. If you're a founder, um, there's various sources of money you can go for. Some of them would be venture capital, some may not. So um, what, what sources of money should founders be looking for, looking at, and, and why those sources? And Jamie, why don't you continue? Sure. So I think, um, you know, founders should, uh, should decide what it is they're looking for. In, uh, is it just that they're looking for money or are they also looking for help? And there's sort of two broad buckets as to where this could come from. There's equity and there's non-equity. So the equity can come from angels or VC firms or accelerator programs like uh, Y Combinator or one we're involved with called Petrie. And, uh, and ideally, if you choose the right one, they're providing a bunch of, of value in addition to just the money, so they might be helping you with recruiting or helping you tell your story or getting access to customers or even mentoring you as founders. The other one is non-equity. And, and sometimes people refer to this as non-dilutive funding. And we are huge fans of non-dilutive funding, provided, however, that it is actually non-dilutive. And I think a mistake people make sometimes is they take grant money because it's free but it's not directly in line with the thing that they wanted to build in the first place. So they end up getting this capital, but it dilutes their effort because they're off building something that isn't the thing that they wished they were building. So uh, anyway, those are the different categories of, of support and, and capital people could be thinking about. And, and um, Matthew, again, you know, Jamie mentioned sort of there's angels, there's venture money, there's various sort of non-dilutive or collaboration money and um, your thoughts on this on, on um, really the sources they should be looking at yeah i think if we were having this conversation five years ago in climate tech and you know we were talking to a group of technical founders probably currently phd or postdoc students or in postdoc roles um we would have had a really different conversation uh we would have talked about initial checks being very small being designed to figure out what it is you were trying to do. And we would have talked about the right source for that, probably being individuals uh, and not investment funds that put other people's money to work and have a lot more rules around how they deploy it. I think in this unique moment where there's so much money coming into climate tech, that's probably no longer the case. Uh, the big decision I think that early stage founders have to make is a different one, which is at what point is this a company versus a project? And, you know, if you go out and raise money from a venture capital investor, right, uh, almost all those funds are what are called 10-year close-ended funds, meaning you get the money in year zero, you're supposed to give it back with profits in year 10. It means the minute one of those folks invests in you, you've now got a clock ticking uh, on how rapidly you need to be able to develop and, you know, start to generate revenue, have customers on board and build a really valuable business. There are real risks to taking money a lot earlier before you have things figured out. And, you know, the longer you can drive uh, toward having a rich and complete story uh, on grants, provided that you know they're they're aligned with what you're doing, or you know what's sometimes called NRE, non-recurring engineering. So basically, services fees from corporations that you're doing research on behalf of uh, really helps you start the clock ticking at an optimal time. So you know, if Matthew, I can what add you to that, Leon, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, if you don't mind me adding, I completely agree with everything Matthew said, but I would just add that. Um, Founders should think hard about whether they should leave the university or not, or whether they should stay there, uh, because the clock is ticking. And by the way, you know, often you have access to um, reasonably cheap labor and access to equipment and things like that. So you know, you go out in the real world, and it can be cold out there. And so you, you know, there better be a good reason that that now is the time to get started. Okay. Right. So, so what you guys have sort of talked about as well, Matthew, you know, we're giving some specific advice, but if we, if we kind of go down from maybe 10,000 feet right to the ground level and get in the mud for a little bit um, and say, you know, how should the founders actually go about raising money for their startup? You know, what are the nitty gritty things they should do? And so, um, well, I'll let Jamie continue. See, see you, you jumped in, so keep going. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay. 
So, I mean, first and foremost, I think the founders need to convince themselves that this is what they want to spend the next five or 10 years of their life doing. And, um, you know, it's not about, hey, can I convince an investor to do it? It's can I convince myself to do it? And is my personal and, you know, is this aligned with my personal and professional goals? Um, then once they're ready to do it, I think they want to uh, research potential investors that are candidates that invest in those spaces at that stage and begin to get to know them even very casually, not, you know, with a deck or, or a formal pitch session, but just, you know, I'd love to get to know you. So that when you're actually asking someone for money, it's not the first time you've ever met them. There are a number of programs around the universities now. Uh, we run one called Frequency, there's Delta V, there's the Sandbox, there's all sorts of uh, projects that help you think about a plan and answer key questions like market sizing and how much money you're gonna need and margins and techno-economics like Matthew described, et cetera. Um, as I'm at, I'll, I'll plug again the founder playlist we have, which has like 100 page guides on how to run a fundraising process. But I'll, I'll just, the uh, one last thing I'll say is, you know, you always want a warm introduction when you're trying to get to an investor because uh, most are inundated with, with hundreds or thousands of inbounds a year. And, and one of the ways they sift it is, is to rely on, on warm introductions from people they trust. Okay. Matthew, anything to add on the nitty gritty? Yeah, I think there's, there's a nexus of two things, right? The, the overarching one is that fundraising is a contact sport. And in the main, she or he with the most contacts wins. Um, a good case that comes to mind for me is a company we've been fortunate to back. Uh, it's actually a Desponde uh, spin out called Via Separations. Um, CEO is a brilliant new woman named Shreya Deve, who founded the company uh, with her co-founder, Brett. And um, the thing that Shreya did incredibly well was start to build relationships with prospective investors more than a year before this had an inkling of being a company. And not in ways that were, you know, kind of fake or patronizing, but, you know, sharing interesting ideas with people who wanted to hear them and looking for their advice. And not only us, you know, but with the team that eventually became the engine and other folks, uh, there was really a lot of trust and confidence in the individuals behind the project that made, uh, you know, looking at it seriously, considering it seriously as an investment, a just kind of natural outgrowth of a dialogue that had already started way before. The other thing that I would get across, it goes to Jamie's point about how investors are inundated, right? It goes, you got, you got to find a way to demonstrate that you're truly exceptional. Uh, there's a, you know, a, a example I've given on this a few times that if you look at pack animals on the, you know, savanna in Southern Africa, uh, generally they all sort of stick together in a clump because they don't want to get picked off by a predator, but there's a small number of them will go to the edge and will actually jump in the air. It's a behavior called stotting. They tend to do it when there's a predator around. You think, wow, evolutionarily, that's pretty stupid, right? No, it's an unfakeable signal. They're basically signaling to the lion upwind. I am so fast and so quick. You will never catch me and I will give you a head start to demonstrate to you that you shouldn't even try. <laughs> I would think about that. You know, how do you start? How do you find something extraordinary about you or your technology, uh, you know, that captures the eye and sends an unfakeable signal? Correct. Well, so that's, uh, you know, I guess, I guess if you maybe, I don't know, I'll sing I'm from Southern Africa using the, the analogy of, of, you know, the lions and the kill here. Um, one of the things we run into a lot, a lot of questions we get from founding teams at MIT is, you know, how they should divide the equity. So let me throw this to you guys. Is that how should they divide the equity and does it even matter how they divide it? And so, uh, you know, Jamie, do you want to jump in on this one? I think it matters. Um, you know, this is a long relationship that you hopefully want to, um, be productive and healthy over a period of time. And so everyone needs to feel like it was handled fairly. And it's a deal that's gonna last, uh, you know, five or 10 years later, people still think it's fair. So so how you actually divide that equity, I think uh, generally should be, you should consider two things, contributions that have been made to date before the company is founded, and then contributions going forward. Uh, and those can be very different. Uh, it could be a faculty person that worked on it for 10 years and a grad student that worked on it for the last three. And on the other side, it could be that it's the, the students that are gonna end up being the founders and CEO 
leaders of the company and work on it 80 hours a week and the faculty is going to work on it a half a day a week. So, um, so all those things need to be taken into consideration. I would say a lot of people tend to just say, hey, let's divide it equally. And while that's sort of the simplest thing and, and maybe the easiest, uh, the path of least resistance, it may not be the solution that lasts the test of time. So and let me let me give you a, a terrifying story on that front uh, that I learned a lot from. So I, I learned venture investing at a firm called Venrock. It's arguably the oldest venture capital firm. It was the Rockefeller family's VC arm in the 1930s. Uh, you know, I show up as this bright-eyed, bushy-tailed total novice, and I get really excited about this uh, technology. It's a university spin-out, actually. Um, and I, I really want to invest in this company. It's going to be the first investment I make. There are four founders. Uh, three of them are technical founders, all out of the same lab, one of whom, it was his PhD thesis. He was the driving force behind the project, uh, clearly sort of the MVP of the technical group. And then two other folks who were really smart and really constructive, played important roles, but probably weren't on the same level when it came to the company's success. And then there was a CEO who was in the business school and had been brought together with the other three in a sort of entrepreneurship program. They really had a commitment uh, to equity uh, between the four of them as co-founders and swore up and down, you know, we want this to be evenly split. You know, we're four equal co-founders. And I did not spend the time with them that I should have to say, are you really sure you want to do this? Try to think three, four or five years down the road how you're going to feel about it. What happened is what you would expect. It became clear that the contributions were quite different in ways that Jamie had just laid out. And it led to a level of bitterness and recrimination and passive aggressive behavior between those team members because they weren't being you know, recognized in a proportionate way that was really personally painful for them. Uh, manage that conflict up front so you don't have to deal with it down the road. Right. Okay, so I think we've got roughly another five minutes we can we can go on this panel, um, just looking looking at our general time clock. So, um, Matthew, you brought up sort of an interesting, I'd say, mistake made by founders. I'm sure there are many other mistakes. So, you know, what, what, let's discuss what are the common mistakes that founders make once they get going with their startups, and and Jamie. I know you've never seen any mistakes in your portfolio, but I'm sure you Not have yet. some thought. Not yet. Who, who go judged first? Yeah, um, I think you know, there's, there's always an umbrella over these things. And the umbrella that I think is really tough for first time founders, it's where having advisors will help you a lot, is you need to be able to see things from the other person's point of view. Um, and particularly in deep tech categories, we tend to find technical founders, A, show up without other folks who are balancing to them in understanding what this looks like as a business. Um, and it encourages a view of their project as kind of a research project looking for a problem to solve uh, in a way that's unfair when it may not be, just because the optics aren't around it of having a more full featured team and taking it seriously as a business versus a technology project. I think the second is just assuming way too much knowledge great founding technical CEOs strike this wonderful balance where they're able to talk in a straightforward way, in a way that's really uh, engaging and respectful about what they're doing, while not assuming knowledge that causes them just to talk right over the head uh, of the person they're trying to fundraise from. The advice I often find myself giving to founders is imagine you were trying to explain this to, let's assume that you know your father is not technical to your dad. You wouldn't talk down to your dad. You wouldn't talk to him like a four-year-old. You wouldn't be disrespectful, you know, or, or speak to him about it in a way that insulted his intelligence. But you would assume that you do something different than he does and would try to explain things crisply, succinctly, with analogies, uh, you know, to get the point across. That's the big thing for me. And we, I, because, you know, the ability to tell a story and communicate is one of the best predictors of CEO's success, like the first job of the CEO is to capitalize the company. So many initial pitches that we take fall out of the pipeline because we just can't understand what it is they're doing. Okay, um, Jamie. So let me ask you now. You know, you sit on you're on a lot. You've been on lots of boards of startups. Um, you're advising the teams. You're advising the CEOs. Um, you know, they've never been there before, and so they are going to make a lot of mistakes just from naivety. 
Um, what are the things you advise them? What are the areas where you say, you know, this is really what you want to do because you don't want to drop into this trap? You know, this is once the company is, is actually up and running. Yeah. Well, I mean, boy, every every snowflake is different here, but I would just say uh, a few categories of things. Um, I would say uh, startup companies in general try to do too many things. They they struggle with focus. I, I feel like we are advising every one of our companies to get focused on fewer activities. Pick one product line, put all your energy behind it. Don't spread yourself across three. Uh, the other is a lot of our founders are doing it for the first time and they don't know how to recruit. Um, the, the whole process of recruiting and judging talent, I remember, when I was a founder and I was building my first company ages ago, I didn't know what great looked like because I had not ever hired a great salesperson or a great marketing person or a great finance person. And so uh, we encourage people to leverage their, their board, their advisors, their mentors, their friends out in the industry to help them interview people and, and help develop a filter for what great looks like so that they can surround themselves with a really strong team. All right, great. So let me let me throw a um, final question to, to each of you before we close. You got you know a quick 10 second answer or 20 seconds. Um, what mistake or mistakes have you made that you wish you'd known about uh, before you started a company? And uh, Jamie, you wanna go and then we'll go to Matthew. Um, I, sort of what I just said a little bit, I made the mistake of hiring a lot of my friends in my first startup. Uh, because they were known and they were trustworthy, but and and they're amazing people. But uh, I should have hired sort of more experienced people that that had you know ten or twenty years of lessons learned that we needed as a team. And and as a result, we didn't achieve what we could have. We we were a speech recognition company, neck and neck with Nuance and SpeechWorks. Both those companies went public and were worth a billion dollars, and we were sold for nineteen. And, and so the cost of, of those decisions was quite clear. Right. And, and uh, Matthew? I didn't do my homework or ask people for advice and spent 90% of my fundraising time trying to raise money from people who were never going to invest in my startup. Uh, all's well that ends well, but man, that could have been a lot easier. Okay, right. Well, you know, we could keep going for, for probably another 25 minutes, but we have uh, lots of presenters waiting in the wings. Um, so I want to really, really thank both of you for, for a fantastic panel today. And also, you know, for all the time um, you spend with the Dishbande Center and with people at MIT and all the various programs. So thanks very much, um, Jamie and Matthew. Thank you, Leon. Um, right. Okay, so now after that great panel, um, we're going to start our first session today. Um, we will hear from some of the MIT teams and Deshpande Center projects that are developing really interesting technologies in uh, fields like chemistry, materials, optics, and electronics. And as I mentioned yesterday, our focus at the Deshpande Center is on commercializing MIT research, really getting that research out into the world where it can have an impact. Um, and what we do at the center is we provide grant money um, and mentoring to the faculty and to the students, um, really so they can move their technology to a point where it can spin out, where, where as Jamie and um, Matthew said, it's really ready for funding. So what we're gonna do now is we'll have five presentations, and then we'll have a break for questions and answers with the presenters. And to kick off the program today, um, our first speaker is Peyton Shea. Peyton is a postdoc uh, in chemistry, and he's going to talk about the technology that they're working on um, for cleavable additives for degradable, recyclable thermoset plastics. So please uh, welcome Peyton. Thanks so much for the introduction, Leon. As you said, my name is Peyton Shea, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Chemistry at MIT. Today, 
I'll be telling you about our work, supported through the Dish Pond Day Center, on cleavable additives for degradable, recyclable thermoset plastics to solve the challenge of plastic waste. Plastic waste is a problem of global significance, given the vast quantities that we generate each day. For many classes of plastics, recycling is bottlenecked by logistical challenges rather than technological feasibility. And the problem lies more in how we can effectively collect plastics to be recycled. For a major class of plastics called thermosets, however, which constitute 18% of all plastics made, the bottleneck is a technological one. Simply stated, we lack effective ways to break down and recycle these materials, even when we have collected them. As a result, these plastics, which are used in environmentally friendly applications, such as turbine blades and wind energy, must simply be buried in landfills or incinerated. The amount of plastic that we are generating is projected to triple over the coming three decades. New technologies to tackle the challenge of plastic waste should not only focus on developing entirely new classes of plastics with recyclability built in, but should also focus on addressing the existing classes of plastics that we use today. Our approach focuses on new ways to endow degradability and recyclability to these existing classes of plastics to head off this growing plastic waste challenge. We have developed an approach to enable the recycling of thermosets through the use of novel chemical additives. Thermosets stand in contrast to many household plastics, which are defined as thermoplastics. These include polyethylene used in plastic wrap and polyethylene terephthalate used in plastic water bottles. Thermoplastics are not crosslinked, so these materials can simply be melted down or dissolved in solvent and remolded for recycling. In contrast, thermosets bear additional chemical crosslinks. These crosslinks make these plastics resistant to melting and dissolution, which is ideal for high performance applications requiring good temperature or solvent resistance. But this also means that thermosets cannot be recycled like thermoplastics. Our approach involves the development of novel chemical additives. These additives have unique properties that enable us to introduce cleavable bonds at precise locations within the thermoset network. By controlling where we introduce the cleavable bonds, we can minimize the amount of additive needed to break down a thermoset into soluble fragments that can be used in recycling. Our approach requires no change in manufacturing workflow beyond blending in our additive before curing and results in no change in material properties owing to the low amount of additives we now need. In one example, we have validated and published on our approach to endow degradability and recyclability to the thermoset polydicyclopentadiene, or PDCPD. PDCPD is a billion dollar a year material and is suitable for a variety of different manufacturing methods, such as reactive injection molding, 3D printing, as well as low energy curing methods, such as frontal polymerization. PDCPD is prepared by the polymerization of DCPD. Like other thermosets, PDCPD is connected through carbon carbon bonds owing to the mechanism of polymerization and curing. As PDCPD is connected through these stable linkages, there is little we can do to break these materials down short of burning them. An example of an additive we, showed, we have developed is shown here, a cyclic compound that contains an oxygen-silicon oxygen or silo ether linkage. This additive copolymerizes with DCPD under standard curing conditions to introduce cleavable silo ether bonds in the PDCPD network. The resulting material has identical mechanical properties to native PDCPD, but can now be dissolved on demand to generate high quality PDCPD fragments and to recover high value embedded reinforcing materials, such as carbon fiber. With the help of the Despondi Center, we have initiated collaborations and material transfer agreements with multiple PDCPD formulators and end users. Moreover, we have scaled up our approach and secured kilogram quantities of our additives to support these collaborations. Thermoset materials are used in a variety of areas, and we are excited about the opportunities to make an impact in this space. For example, there are other classes of thermoset plastics beyond PDCPD that are amenable to our approach with the right additives. In addition, 
Thermosetting materials are also found as adhesives and coatings. Simple ways to break these down and remove them on demand can help manage end-of-life product disposal. Our approach of making degradable versions of these existing materials can offer tremendous value to organizations striving to reach their sustainability objectives. Through our conversations with industry veterans across the infrastructure, coatings, and automotive spaces, we have received universally positive feedback on the potential of our technology. With the support of the Dish Pond Day Center, we are excited to tackle these different areas, utilizing our core strength in novel additive discovery to address this global challenge of plastic waste. So on behalf of my team, which includes Keith Husted, Professor Jeremiah Johnson, and Professor Rafael Gomez Bombarelli, with expertise across experimental and computational materials discovery, I just wanted to thank you for your time and attention, and I'm happy to talk more in our breakout session. Um, thank you very much, um, Peyton. And our next speaker is going to be Tian Gu. Tian is a postdoc in material science, and he's going to tell us about the ultra wide field of view um, optics, flat optics platform that they're working on. Uh, please welcome Tian. Thank you for the introduction, Leon. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Tian Gu. Today, I'm going to present you our recent progress on ultra compact high-performance metal surface flat optics. Wide-angle optical systems are always desired for high-performance imaging, sensing, display, and many other applications. In contrast to human eyes that can give us a field of view up to about 200 degrees uh, with two eyes, conventional camera lenses require much more complicated multi-lens assemblies. Take fisheye lens, for example. Usually, at least a seven to 10 lenses are stacked together to correct for the angle-dependent aberrations. As a result, the design complexity, bulkiness, and incurred high costs have limited the practical deployment of wide-angle optical systems. This performance gap is further exaggerated in the rapid growing markets involving human-machine interactions, such as 3D optical sensors, augmented or virtual reality devices, and so on. As an example, 3D optical sensors nowadays rely on uh, conventional lens assemblies and they usually have a limited field of view, less than 90 degrees. On the other hand, mini fisheye lenses comp uh, compromises on the imaging qualities and they usually uh, use uh, bulkier structures. Our customer interviews have indicated that compact wide field of view 3D sensors are indeed highly demanded. Our team pioneered a novel metasurface flat optic technology which is capable of high resolution imaging over a record hemispherical field of view. Metal surfaces are optically thin sub-wavelength array nanostructures that are engineered to provide almost arbitrary control of a propagation of light while maintaining high optical efficiency. Our wide field of view metal lens consists of a single flat transparent substrate with an input aperture on the front surface and a metal surface on the back surface. Light beams incident on the input aperture at different incident angles are refracted to the backside uh, metal surface and continues to focus onto a planar focal plane. We have demonstrated that our metal lens design can achieve diffraction limited imaging performance over a record 180 degree field of view. The design can be used in both ways for light detection and emission. This means that we can obtain high resolution aberration free imaging or image projection, not only near the capsule center, but also at the edge of a panoramic scene. Furthermore, our design architecture is generic and can be adapted to different spectral uh, range of light. The metal surface fabrication is compatible with the standard CMOS processes so that we can leverage semiconductor foundries to scale the manufacturing at low cost. Leveraging this novel metal lens technology, we are developing advanced 3D sensing solutions with dramatically improved performance, as well as the size, weight, power, and cost advantages. Here, we utilize the same metal lens architecture for illumination and camera optics, which is universally applicable to all major methods of imaging-based 3D sensor. Compared to state-of-the-art, our metal lens-based 3D sensor features a 2x extended field of view 
10x higher resolution, enhance the signal to noise ratio, and also an ultra compact form factor with a minimum element count. When integrated with AR or VR modules, the embedded 3D sensor will provide an immersive 180 degree field of view and an angular resolution matching the human eye. We envision that our compact 3D sensor will find wide applications in consumer electronics, automotives, industrial automation, and so on. In addition to 3D sensing, our flat optic approach will also transform a variety of critical optical technologies that still rely on traditional optical systems today. Our unique optical architecture and engineering capabilities allow highly versatile development of technologies to meet diverse needs in consumer, defense, and medical sectors. Lastly, I would like to introduce our core team members here. Our team uniquely consists of material scientists, applied physicists, and optical engineers from MIT. We have in-depth experience in design, fabrication, and prototyping of metal surface flat optics. We work together not only to tackle the most challenging problems, but also develop a platform to allow people to reimagine what they can do with optics. We think this is the right time to transition the technologies to market and look forward to developing synergies within the community. With that, I will conclude my talk. I welcome you to stop by during the breakout session and reach out to me offline. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tian. Um, our next speaker is going to be Brian Anthony. Uh, Brian is a research scientist in mechanical engineering at MIT. And Brian is going to talk about the control of manufacturing processes using machine learning. Uh, please welcome Brian. Leon, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Brian Anthony, as Leon said, and today I'd like to share with you a little bit about our work in deep reinforcement learned control, or how we're making actionable data analytics in the smart factory. Learned control, what, what is it? Um, in manufacturing, you have control signals and materials that are going into a machine. And that machine is taking material in and putting material out, the product, final product, or work in progress, and also generating a lot of data. Whether we're talking about making coffee that you're enjoying for your morning brew, um, and whether it be a light roast or a dark roast or something in between, uh, or you're making optical fiber or, or fiber for your clothing, which if you look at it in cross section has different mechanical, electrical and optical properties. All of these products, coffee, fiber, um, additive manufacturing, there, there's a machine making a product. Those machines here, a coffee roaster. Um, or a fiber extruding device have data and control signals associated with it. Pressures and temperatures and gas flow as a function of time, force and velocity as a function of time. So what is machine learning? What does data analytics have to do with this? In the manufacturing environment, at the heart of maintaining quality and achieving a certain performance is real-time feedback control where you have a set of, of things that you want to maintain, either their, their absolute controlled value over time as a steady state or some, some value that's changing. And in the context of fiber, we are controlling the preform speed of the glass ingot that's being put into a furnace. We're controlling the furnace temperature. We're controlling the tension with which we're pulling the fiber and we ultimately control the fiber diameter or other mechanical aspects of the fiber. For all of these things, for all of these parameters, all these settings, the general framework is we have some type of process before that process are, are control signals that drive that process. And those control signals are determined by a thing called a controller. And that controller takes as input, what is it that we want, our set point? What is it that we're getting? And making decisions, based on either the error or the derivative of the error or the integral of the error between what we want and what we get. Now, many processes um, in the manufacturing environment use sort of very classical techniques, such as proportional integral derivative control, or slightly more complex techniques, such as state space modeling or linear quadratic control, or um, you know, do a little bit of modeling of the, of the physics. 
Now, in all of these scenarios, all of these sort of classical and heavily used control strategies, they're very much tuned and optimized to a particular and nominal set point. They work very well when we're trying to produce a particular roast of coffee, a particular color, or trying to achieve a particular uh, nominal diameter of our optical fiber. It's very hard for these controllers in general to then be reconfigured rapidly and changed to operate at a new set point to produce fiber, say, with modulated diameter or a larger diameter or coffee with different tastes and colors. So it's hard on the factory floor to take these real-time feedback control systems and adjust them. It's hard to model the systems that they're controlling. It's hard to model fluid dynamics, heat mass transfer and vibration, except operating around the steady state of operation, which is where these control strategies work very well. Where we are innovating is learning to control dynamic processes that are otherwise hard to model in real time. The impact of our work is we fit into the existing control strategy of life. Time varying signals driving a machine, making a product, and we learn to control. We learn the physics of operation. We learn to optimize the process. We learn to make new variants of the process. In the context of machine learning, the architecture that we use is a, a, um, an agent and action uh, critic uh, in, uh, feedback loop where our, our action is the controller, our environment is the manufacturing process, our state and reward is the sensor reading, and our agent is the controller putting a little bit more sort of context to that, a little more graphical, um, you know, paying attention to the, the, the big picture here. Uh, we have a machine that has a product that is producing here, the fiber. In this architecture of this actor critic approach, if we drill into the actor, the actor is nothing more than our control system. The actor is your conventional feedback controller where you have a system here, the extruder, the spool, the plant that's doing the thermal heating of the fiber, and we have the thing called the DRL agent, the deep reinforcement agent that is controlling in real time. But sitting on top of that is all of the additional machine learning infrastructure that you would typically do offline. We, as we're doing the real-time control, we record our history of data. And as we observe that history, we steadily learn about the physics, we steadily learn about the process, so as we're learning, instead of taking our data and then doing an offline batch sort of interpretation of the data, we learn about it in real time, we update it in real time so that we have simultaneously the real-time learning, the real-time control that allows us to be more innovative in how we perform control of fiber production or coffee production. The graph here is just showing that over time, if we tell the system, no prior knowledge about how it operates, it can, with different learning rates, get back to a performance level that exceeds what a classical PID controller can do for us. The experiments here, um, a little bit on fiber, what's really interesting here is you know, the summary that the, our deep reinforcement learning approach is beating the benchmarks of PI, PID, um, and other uh, classical control strategies. But if you think of fiber extruding for a second, it's a, a material in and material out. It's a mass flow problem. And our learning approach learned here how to simultaneously push and pull the material that's coming out and the material that's going in to very rapidly respond to step change command inputs on modulating the fiber diameter. So the system that we've developed, it's a control strategy that doesn't require analytical or numerical models to start, but it learns them. It can predictably, after learning those models, predict what new control strategies should be put in place to optimize performance. We're able to implement this in real time. It uses the reinforcement learning, the deep reinforcement learning architecture, but at the edge and in real time. We've deployed it on a fiber drawing system and in progress in, in coffee roasting. And we look forward to applying this to other areas, other processes, other manufacturing processes that are, are difficult to track and hard to model. I thank you for your attention and want to also recognize the graduate students that have been heavily involved, uh, both Songwoon Kim and David Kim.
uh, and, and welcome your questions on deep reinforcement learning control. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, our next speaker, um, Svetlana Boroskina, is also a research scientist in mechanical engineering. And Svetlana is going to tell us of a smart polyethylene fabric that is both antimicrobial and very easy to care for. Uh, please welcome Svetlana. Hello. I'm Svetlana Bariskina. I work in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at MIT. And today I am happy to talk to you about the technology and the development in my group. And that is technology focusing on high performance and sustainable polyethylene fabrics. So this type of textile is monomaterial, meaning only one material is used without being blended or mixed with anything else. It provides passive cooling functionality to the wearer. It is stain resistant and it is a sustainable technology. So who can benefit from this type of technology? Well, obviously all of us can because all of us wear clothes, but we identified a couple of potential customers that can benefit more than others. And one type of customers are mothers of children who have to wash or fathers if they have to wash a lot of clothes. And uh, we know that children's clothes need a lot of washing they can benefit from a passive cooling functionality because children cannot complain often, uh, they cannot speak yet. And uh, this type of clothes can really benefit from detergent-free washing to, ev to avoid any kind of skin conditions. And not surprisingly, this is a large global market for this type of textiles. Another type of application that our technology can help with is athletic apparel. It's also a large global market and uh, needs are very similar. So need for passive cooling to increase performance, especially in adverse weather conditions, a need for fast drying, a challenge to keep clean when you're working out in the field, and uh, order and microbial resistance are obvious performance requirements for this type of uh, application. So our technology helps to address all these challenges. And also it helps to address a broad impact problem, which is the textile industry in general, uh, which is a global polluter, and it causes uh, water shortages, release of toxic chemicals, release of microplastics in the environment. And if a technology can minimize all this or avoid completely uh, all of these consequences, it's uh, an additional plus. So how our technology works, we start with a common plastic polyethylene, which can come in the virgin variety from petrochemicals, recycled variety, or it can be bio-derived from sugarcane. We spin this plastic uh, in the form of a fiber and yarn. We color those fibers without using any water in a dry fashion. And then we weave or knit them into fabrics and garments that can be recycled multiple times because we only use one material to achieve performance. What makes this fabric unique and why people could benefit from these properties? It's because we engineered the fabric on multiple scales to change the properties of polyethylene, which is normally hydrophobic, meaning it rejects water, that would make it very uncomfortable on the skin because it traps uh, perspiration under the fabric. But we change the uh, properties of the fiber surface to make them hydrophilic, and that allows for moisture weaken and quick evaporation. We also engineered the properties of the fabrics to make them tunable for the uh, thermal radiation transport. So radiation heat from the human body. This is a natural cooling mechanism that is unfortunately impeded by conventional textiles which absorb this radiative body heat. So our fabric actually helps to release this body heat efficiently, providing passive cooling functionality. We also exploit the natural uh, inertness and stain resistance of polyethylene, which is illustrated in this figure, even if you try to stain it on purpose and then rinse with cold water without any detergent, it emerges completely clean, not the same with other materials we tested. And that obviously helps to save water energy and avoid the use of detergent. And um, again, uh, people with skin conditions can really benefit from this type of inert fabric that does not require uh, use of detergent because that can minimize any sort of skin irritation. Uh, this technology is sustainable in the sense that it generates a very small environmental footprint in the fabrication. 
And on the left, I show a simple example of just water usage for a T-shirt from our material and T-shirt uh, made of uh, conventional material cotton. So you can see a huge difference. And on the right, we show uh, an overall environmental footprint that needs to be as small as possible uh, for a fabric to not leave an impact uh, on the world. And you can see that our fabrics actually have the smallest environmental footprint. And we also uh, hope that this technology can help to eliminate a vast amount of accumulated plastic waste that is currently not used because it's not economically viable. So applications we look at include uh, baby apparel, athletic apparel, as I already mentioned, but also we are looking at more advanced applications in military textiles and uh, space and planetary exploration. And we work with a few industrial partner partners uh, in this endeavor. And finally, I would like to thank the team of students and postdocs who contributed to this project over the years and all the sponsors who support our research. And uh, we welcome new members to this team. So if you would like to work with us either on a research collaboration or in supporting our research or commercialization efforts, please reach out to me at email or website uh, that I indicated at the bottom of this slide. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure talking to you. Well, thank you very much, Svetlana. Um, our next speaker is also um, in the area of sustainability, and um, that's Don Sadaway. Don is a professor of material science at MIT, and Don is going to tell us um, about a battery for supplying power off the grid um, that's based on a low-cost aluminum molten salt technology. Please welcome Don. Well, thank you, Leon, for those uh, kind words. Um, well, let's get started here. Uh, I want to talk today about uh, work I'm doing on a new battery. It's an aluminum molten salt battery, and it's designed for off-grid power supply. Uh, the problem that we're attacking is the intermittency of renewable sources of electrical energy. What happens when the sun doesn't shine? What happens when the wind doesn't blow? And um, the term of art is long duration power delivery. That is to say four hours uh, up to, uh, and at scale means uh, tens to uh, hundreds of kilowatt hours. And um, uh, by the way, lithium ion doesn't work at, at this uh, application. It fails, first of all, at cost. It's still far too high. Uh, it's uh, unsafe. The harder, the, 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 the larger, lithium ion becomes, the greater the, the threat of fire. And we all are familiar with how the battery fades and its uh, ability to deliver charge. And um, uh, the lifetime is just too short for this application. So we have to find something else. And uh, so my proposal is to innovate in the, the battery chemistry. And what I've been working on is a combination of aluminum and sulfur. And uh, the electrolyte cannot be aqueous, it has to be something other than uh, uh, water. So we've uh, resorted to molten salts. And uh, the really exciting piece here is that the capital cost of these components is very low. Uh, we're forecasting 5% that of uh, lithium ion batteries today. And uh, we've done the work at MIT, we've reduced it practice in the laboratory, and then with the Desplande Center funding, we're now looking at uh, scaling it up and uh, moving it towards commercialization. Just so that you have a picture of what this is all about, uh, you have uh, three layers here. The bottom layer is aluminum, metal, that's the negative electrode. The opposite electrode is elemental sulfur, and in between we have a molten salt of uh, the, the electrolyte. Um, sulfur is a, an insulator, so in order to give it some electronic conductivity, we have to mix it with some carbon. And then uh, we have a, an aluminum current collector on the back side of the sulfur electrode. To prevent shorting, we put a little bit of a spacer in here. It could be polymer, it could be fiberglass. And then if we want to coil this up into a jelly roll configuration, we have a, another insulator on the back side of one of the current collectors. And so there it is. We've done uh, considerable work. Uh, last uh, Monday, I sent off this manuscript to Nature, 
uh, in which we talk about how fast we can charge this battery and do so without uh, the risk of uh, dendrites, these needle-like uh, protrusions from the electrode shorting across and, and causing fire. So here's a few uh, examples of uh, data from here that I draw your attention to the red lines. The one that's moving up is the charging line and the one that uh, moves left to right descending, that's the discharge. And you can see it's a plateau at around one volt and it goes out to about a thousand milliamp hours per gram, which is a respectable amount of charge and the D over five means five hour discharge cycle. Um, this thing can also uh, work under very, very rapid charging. So the blue on the, on the left is 10C. That means one-tenth of an hour. That's six minutes to go to full charge. And on the right, the red, that's 100C. That's one-hundredth of an hour. That's 36 seconds to go from zero to full charge. And uh, you can see that this is not some kind of capacitive uh, storage. The fact that at 100 C, we get uh, 300 milliamp hours per gram, that means this is really charging the battery. So this is fantastic. And all of these are discharged at two levels. Now, how does the thing compare with uh, today's lithium ion battery? Uh, with our early uh, work, we estimate about 742 watt hours per liter. And if you compare that to a very, very uh, well developed resource, uh, lithium ion battery, this has nickel, uh, manganese, cobalt, uh, it's 804. And, you know, these are differences without distinction. Aluminum sulfur is in, in the ballpark. But where things are really uh, differentiated is here in the capital cost. Aluminum sulfur is $2.40 per kilowatt hour for the cost of the aluminum sulfur and the salt. And compare that to the projections on lithium ion for that uh, nickel manganese cobalt unit I'd shown you, that's $47 per kilowatt hour. So we're down below 5% of the cost of lithium ion. This is really, really good. So uh, what's next? Uh, I've started a company. It's called Avanti Battery Company. It's in Charlestown, uh, only two miles away from MIT campus. And it's been established to try to commercialize this uh, new invention. And so uh, if we ask something, we would say we're seeking funding for Series A, and that means money to de-risk and bring this technology to market at scale. And that means we're going to build something that is the size of, say, a part of power an iPhone, 4,000 milliamp hours, and uh, that's where we are. Thank you. And thanks to the Despondi Center for its support. Uh, thank you very much, Don. Um, and I'd also like to thank all of our speakers uh, who, who spoke so eloquently at this morning's session and, of course, kept uh, to the time budget, so we're right on time. Uh, what we're going to do now is go to the breakout sessions where you can interact with the speakers, ask them questions, um, and discuss their various technologies. Um, for those of you who were here yesterday, you'll be very familiar with how to do that. Uh, we're using the Hoppen Expo booths. If you look on the left side of your screen, you'll see Expo. Just click on Expo, then you'll see a selection of different booths. Pick the ones you want to visit. You can hop in from one booth to the other so you can move around. Um, if you want to interact with the speakers, you'll see a, a button called Share Audio and Video. Just click on that and, and you'll be interacting live. Um, we can only have 10 people at a time who are actually interacting with audio and video. So if 10 people are doing it already, you may just sort of have to wait. You can hear everything, see everything that's going on while that's happening. Um, and you can also exchange um, comments via the chat within the booth. Don't, I know yesterday we had a number of people who was maybe a little bit shy who stayed in the background, but please feel free to go live and, and uh, interact in the conversation. And just think of this like a virtual um, poster session where you're talking to the team. Um, so what we're going to 
do now is, is go to the booths and we'll meet back um, here at, about, at 12.30 and just continue with the program. And we're gonna start promptly at 12.30. So when you're ready to do that, just leave the, the, the booth and the expo booth and just click on stage and you'll be right back here. And um, we'll see you in just a little over 20 minutes. Well, welcome back. I, I hope you enjoyed um, the breakout sessions. I know some of them uh, were still going and sorry to pull you folks back. Now, those of you who were here yesterday know that we discussed a South African uh, chicken recipe. Well, I had uh, quite a few emails from people who said, you know, we really are more fish than chicken eaters. So can you uh, maybe plus something we can do with fish. So here is, is, is um, an approach for cooking fish. Um, it's very simple. Um, I actually learned this from my brother in Scotland when visiting him. Uh, he's a very good cook and I was a bit skeptical, but this works really well. So here is the uh, fish in the dish recipe. So what do you need? Well, you need some fish and you could use uh, salmon, a white fish, um, cod, haddock, probably half a pound to a pound. Um, and if, you know, what I would suggest, if you can, if you know how to skin it, you can skin it yourself or have the person at the fish counter skin it. Um, and so you need the fish, you need a dish. So he has a dish. This is a Pyrex, um, about an eight inch Pyrex, needs to be something that can fit in your microwave. Um, and what you do is you take, you take the fish, here's the fish, here's a piece of salmon, you take the fish, you put the fish in the dish. So the fish is in the dish. Once the fish is in the dish, you take, um, season the fish, put something on it. So with salmon, I'll use some rosemary. Here's rosemary that I just cut from the garden. Throw some spikes of rosemary on, some dill. Here's some dill seed. You could use fresh chopped up dill, um, salt and pepper. Flip the fish over, do it on both sides. With the salmon, I like to put a few tablespoons of white wine in. That was the white wine. And then the other key ingredient is you want some shrink wrap. Here is, is some plastic wrap. And what you want to do is take the plastic wrap, wrap it over this Pyrex dish, make sure it's completely sealed. You pop it in the microwave and you microwave it 
Um, depending on how much fish you've got in there, if it's half a pound, I'd say start at about two minutes and then check the temperature, take your little digital thermometer, put it in there and the temperature needs to be at around um, 135 to 140 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, which is about 60 degrees centigrade. Um, do not go much above that, and that's in the thickest part of the fish. If you take this thing up to 160, 180, you've destroyed it. So if it's not at the right temperature, put more shrink wrap on, put it in for another 30 seconds, and just keep doing that till you get up to the right temperature. Eventually, you'll figure out, depending on the amount of fish and the microwave, what you need to do. So um, that's the salmon approach. If you were doing a white fish like a haddock or a, or, or a cod, um, I don't use the rosemary or the dill or the white wine. I'll just put in a few tablespoons of water um, and microwave it. Um, if you wanted to add any sauces or anything on top, don't do those in the microwave. Cook them separately and put them on top. So there we have it, folks. That is fish in a dish, and it is really delish. And uh, please try it. Um, I know you'll be skeptical initially, but I assure you it's going to be fantastic. Okay, so now on to the rest of our program. As I mentioned yesterday, um, you know, one of the reasons for the success of the Deshpande Center, maybe it's our secret source, it are our catalysts or mentors who really work with the projects and help them move their technologies along. And we'd like to really thank them for their tremendous amount of time, energy, effort, um, and dedication. And we also have um, individuals, foundations, and corporations who provide funding to us to keep the center sustained. Um, and we would certainly like to thank all of those people um, as well. Um, in our corporate program, we have Sanofi, Ema, Henkel, and Lockheed Martin who provided funding for many, many years. And, and thank you very much. Any corporations that are interested in getting engaged with the Deshpande Center to help our projects, maybe be part of our corporate program, please uh, be in touch with us. And our, to start off the next sec, uh, segment of speakers, our first speaker is going to be um, Stephen Barrett. Stephen is a professor of Aero Astro um, at MIT, and he's gonna tell us about his very silent solid state drones. Uh, please welcome Stephen. Thanks, Leon. Drones are now an increasingly important part of our lives. Some professions use drones every day. For example, if you look at the um, lives of US soldiers, they will often use small drones called RQ-11 Ravens to provide last minute reconnaissance, surveillance and intelligence that's critical to saving the lives of, of soldiers. Now, aside from military applications, drones have many other applications. And it's estimated that overall drones are about a $40 billion a year market. Applications include, as well as in defense, emergency services, agriculture, construction, and in oil and gas. Now, if we think about um, the future going beyond what drones are used for today and beyond the entertainment uses of drones, there's also the potential for package delivery. This example here is in Scotland where drones have been used to deliver COVID-19 test kits, but a bigger market in the long run would be a package delivery, for example, like what Amazon are doing with Amazon Prime Air, where you could potentially get packages delivered to your home in minutes rather than days. Now that has been forecast to be a $50 billion a year market, so potentially a huge opportunity for uh, drones and, and their application. Now, what many of these different applications have in common, both the existing applications like intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance, and future applications like package delivery, are that their ability to be effective is constrained by noise. And that noise comes from the propellers. So propeller noise is a key constraint on the growth of drones in, in these applications. What we are proposing to address this is to develop 
a silent propulsion system. In other words, a propulsion system for drones that has no moving parts. The physical principle that this operates on is called electroaerodynamic propulsion. This works by charging a wire to a very high voltage such that the air around it gets ionized, meaning electrons are stripped off, leaving positively charged ions. These ions are accelerated electrostatically towards a negatively charged airfoil shape. Those ions collide with neutral air molecules, transferring momentum to them and creating an ionic wind. This is the mechanism of creating propulsion with no moving parts like propeller blades. Over the last 10 years at MIT, we've advanced the basic understanding of that and then developed a flying prototype airplane, which first flew in uh, 2018. The airplane prototype is shown here. It's about five meters in wingspan, flew for about 10 seconds, although had an endurance of 90 seconds and uh, was the first flight of an airplane with no moving parts. If we zoom in under the wings, you can see how the propulsive force is generated. That's by an array of wires that generate the ions and then an array of airfoils that we neutralize those ions with a wind being generated under the wing. Now, let me show you a video comparing the first flight of this airplane to a flight of the Raven. This will give you a sense of how quiet ion propulsion is compared to conventional propulsion as is used in the Raven uh, drone. What this demonstrates is that you can hear conventional propulsion from many, many tens of meters away, whereas within a few meters, iron propulsion is completely silent. That clearly has value in applications such as intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, where you wouldn't want uh, to reveal your position, and is useful in cases like package delivery, where silent package delivery is much more likely to be accepted, and also in other areas like traffic monitoring or air pollution monitoring, where you don't want to create noise pollution. Now we've developed that version two aircraft, which flew for 10 seconds, but had a 90 second endurance. We're now working on a version three, which has significantly advanced the technology over version two in 2018, such that now we can target endurances of up to 30 minutes carrying a small payload. Now that's not quite competitive yet with the RQ-11 Raven, but we think that's getting to the point where with a successful demonstration here, we will, demo we will be at the edge of commercializing the technology and producing a small scale drone. So our overall trajectory is that over the last 10 years, we've developed and published the fundamental science. Now we're advancing to the point of a demonstrator with an outdoor flight of some tens of minutes. And we see that as a critical staging point to then starting a company which will aim to produce uh, intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance um, targeted drone, uh, as well as drones that can um, apply to other applications such as environmental monitoring. If we look beyond the next few years though, we see that such drones could potentially be useful in the $50 billion a year market, which is package delivery. So thank you for your attention and I look forward to seeing you in the breakout room. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, while, while Stephen was giving his talk, I actually had a few emails um, some people wanted some clarifications on the fish in the dish recipe. Um, so let me give them to you. Um, if you want to make larger quantities than say pound, which is, you know, 500, kilo, 500 grams, not kilograms, um, you really need to do it in multiple batches when you're in a microwave. It's not like an oven where you just put a big piece of fish in. So you just do multiple batches. It's very fast, um, very easy to do. Uh, with a white fish, it's probably a good idea to put a few pieces of butter on top of it, adds a little bit of extra flavor. With a salmon, you don't want to do that because it's a reasonably oily fish. And with the salmon, as I said, I tend to use um, rosemary spikes and then I'll throw some dill on as well. You can use dill seeds or just chopped dill. So enough of cooking and uh, on to another topic.
Our next speaker is going to be Francesco Benedetti. Francesco is a postdoc in chemical engineering, and uh, he'll tell us what he's cooking up there. Um, and Francesco is going to talk about his polymer membranes, which have exceptional performance and stability. So please welcome Francesco. Thank you so much, Leon, for the very nice introduction. And thanks, everybody, for being here. We are very excited. Our team is developing clean tech solutions to transform the way chemical separations are performed. And why this matters so much? Because separation and purification processes account for up to 15% of the world energy consumption. And this is because we still rely on century-old, highly inefficient technologies to perform these separations. So our mission is to eliminate energy waste with our efficient separation technology, drastically reducing production costs and CO2 emissions. So why traditional separations are so inefficient? Because they still require heat to make the separation happen. On the other hand, membrane technology offer a completely different approach to separation. They operate as molecular filters to separate molecules from one another. But the problem with traditional membranes is that they present low selectivity, which translates into operating costs. We bring innovation in this space by completely changing the way materials to make membranes are designed. And we've been able to maximize the performance of these materials, achieving unprecedented permeability and the selectivity combination that allow us to reduce the energy consumption to a minimum. These materials are also very easy to synthesize and they're chemically, thermally, and mechanically stable, which allow us to believe that we can make a difference in the space and bring these membrane uh, technologies to the market. In fact, our first product is going to be a compact membrane module, which is a key aspect of power plant and production platform, like the offshore natural gas production platform that you see here on the left. Our innovation comes in the materials that these compact membrane modules are made of, and this thin layer allows us to reach the performance that we mentioned in the previous slide. We also have a very clear strategy to implement this product into the market. And we're going to first replace existing membrane modules, which require no infrastructural change, which is key for fast adoption. And in the second moment, we're going to revamp industrial plants using traditional processes. That, that is going to be our very final target. And we know through our customer interviews that for small and medium-sized companies, the pain is bigger because they cannot scale down effectively the traditional technologies. So we know where to start and was our first customer. The market opportunity in this space is huge because we're going to target the $20 billion market of gas and vapor separation, 1.5 billion of which requires no infrastructural change. But we're also ready to provide solutions for the carbon capture opportunity, which is a $60 billion market expected to be by 2027. Our beachhead application is natural gas upgrading, which is a $3 billion market that is growing year after year. And this is expected to replace coal-fired plants, making energy generation more sustainable with less than half CO2 emitted per kilowatt hour produced. If we were to replace the absorption column, like the commercial standard that you can see here on the left, which now represents 90% of the market with our membranes technology, we can reduce product loss by up to 85% and generate operating cost, uh, reducing operating costs down to $800 million per year, reducing at the same time emission up to 60 million metric tons per year. If we pick our potential customer, which is a billion standard cubic feet per day of natural gas plant, we can generate a value for them of $50 million reduction in operating cost and the revenue for our company of around $25 million of membrane modules that we can sell. But this is really not the end of the story. Actually, it's just the beginning because we've tested our materials in many different environments and four different applications. And we know that we can generate value for each of them. In particular, hydrogen purification is a big target for us. And also oxygen generation, which is a great opportunity for medical gas uh, applications, but also to enable carbon capture in power plants like oxycombustion. And of course, we're going to also target cambor culture at point sources we mentioned and natural and biogas upgrading. 
So we started our journey in 2018, and with the support and help of MIT, Stanford, and NSF, we overcame a lot of the challenges in making these materials really unprecedented. And today we achieved the breakthrough in terms of performance. We patented our technology and we validated interest on, uh, on, this, on the technology by interviewing more than 20 customers. We also have a very clear roadmap for the next couple of years because we know how to de-risk our technology. We're going to investigate the effect of contaminants, work on scaling up the polymer production, and also manufacturing films. All the way to produce our first uh, prototype that is going to allow us to sign pilot agreements with customers and eventually provide clean tech solutions to them and transform the way chemical separations are performed. Of course, this would not be possible without an amazing team that is very well positioned to meet this challenge from the molecular design to the industrial process implementation, because we have a background in organic chemistry, material science, and chemical and process engineering. And also, it is a very exciting time for us today because we are, we have, we are anticipated to spin out a company in the next couple of months, Osmosis. And please feel free to reach out to us at the email that you see here, info at osmosis.tech, because we're very excited to talk with investors, industry people, and all that are in, in uh, really uh, engaged in uh, gas separation applications. We're also going to go through iCorp in the next, starting in five days from now. So please reach out if you want to talk to us. And also, I really want to thank all the sponsors that allow us to be where we are today and thank all those that will be us from now on. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Francesca. Uh, our next speaker is Max Robinson. Max is a postdoc in chemical engineering. Um, and his project is funded by a grant from the Jamil Water and Food security program. And Max is going to talk about an early detection system for crop pathogens. Uh, please welcome Max. Thanks, Leon, for that introduction. My name is Max, and I'm really excited to speak to you today about our work in creating an early detection system for the citrus disease, HLD. Currently, more than $1 trillion worth of agricultural production is at risk of a devastating disease outbreak. This risk is increased by our globalized food system, changing ecosystems due to climate change, and the use of food crops that lack the genetic diversity to resist disease outbreaks. There are three key drivers to addressing the challenge of disease in food crops. First, you must have knowledge of the disease, its cause, symptoms, and methods of spread. Second, you must have proven strategies to mitigate the disease. Third, you must have an effective method of detection to permit precise understanding of where the disease is located. When one driver is missing or is inadequate, an effective response to disease may not be possible. In this project, we are innovating to improve our capabilities in crop disease detection. In particular, we address the detection challenge posed by the citrus disease, HLB. HLB is an incurable citrus disease that ultimately kills the affected plant. On top of this, HLB has a long asymptomatic period of well over a year. Therefore, early detection is critical to halting its spread. The combination of these factors has made HLB a profound challenge to citrus agriculture. HLB is a global problem, as illustrated by the yellow and green areas of this map that indicate regions where HLB is present. We have good knowledge of HLB disease, what causes it, how it's spread, and its progression. We also have strategies to mitigate HLB disease. For instance, quickly removing and replacing HLB positive trees is a strategy that keeps a citrus grove profitable. However, current methods of HLB early detection are inadequate, and thus HLB is currently incredibly hard to manage. Take, for example, the situation in the state of Florida. In 2008, HLB was first identified in the state. By 2014, HLB had become a destructive epidemic, leading to more than a 40% reduction in statewide acreage. Nearly 100% of citrus in Florida have HLB. But the story doesn't end there. 
HLB is also a threat in California, where 85% of U.S. fresh citrus is produced. In 2014, HLB was first identified. The question is, when will it become an epidemic? The answer is we don't know because we don't have adequate means of detecting the disease at early stages. Leaf by leaf PCR tests are the current method of early HLB detection. This requires leaf removal from the tree and a subsequent test days or even weeks later at an offsite location. The disease resides at a handful of leaves out of many thousands at early stages. Thus, the chances of detecting HLB early using PCR tests is very low. We conducted over 50 stakeholder interviews and identified three key requirements for effective early HLB detection. First, the technology must be highly accurate. Second, it must be timely in that it must be able to detect HLB just weeks after infection. Finally, it must be affordable to growers. To achieve these requirements, we are creating technology that can detect HLP at the scale of whole trees rather than the leaf by leaf testing of PCR. Plants produce signature volatile organic compounds or VOCs during disease states. In the case of citrus, signature VOCs are produced when a citrus plant is healthy as well as just weeks into asymptomatic HLB disease. Therefore, VOCs represent a cloud of detectable biomarkers around the plant. We are using VOCs detection as a whole tree diagnostic for HLB. However, currently available gas sensors do not meet all of the requirements for field detection of HLB. For example, mass spec is highly sensitive, but it comes at a prohibitive cost. We've invented a patent pending sensors technology that meets the requirements of the HLB detection challenge. The invented sensors technology is humidity initiated gas sensors or HIG sensors. HIG sensors employ the impedance of water vapor self assembled at sensor surfaces to detect VOCs at low concentrations. Since water is the medium by which HIG sensors detect VOCs, complex and costly conductive materials are not needed. Also, since Higgs sensors exploit ambient water vapor rather than treat them as an undesirable contaminant, Higgs sensors demonstrate remarkable humidity resilience. We will deploy our sensors technology to California to halt the spread of HLB. Confirmed cases of HLB, shown in red, are located in Southern California, shown in green. However, HLB threatens to spread north to the San Joaquin Valley, shown in blue. The San Joaquin Valley incorporates 80% of California's citrus acreage. We will deploy a statewide detection service to enhance HLB mitigation in Southern California, but also to protect the high production in the San Joaquin Valley. To do this, we will perform detection at Southern California groves proximal to the current HLB perimeter. In addition, we will also select groves in the San Joaquin Valley to provide a rapid alert should HLB appear. Currently, we are prototyping devices. Later this year, we plan to perform a pilot with Citrus. We then plan on deploying an HLB detection service next year. Thanks so much for your attention. I look forward to speaking with potential investors and collaborators in the breakout session. Thank you very much, Max. Um, and our next speaker is going to be Josue Lopez, and he's a PhD in electrical engineering and computer science. And he's gonna tell us about the LIDAR on a chip they've developed, which will enable autonomous machines to see the world much more clearly. Please welcome Jose. Leon, thanks for the introduction. I'm excited to share with all of you today how the Solyachich Group is building a LIDAR on a chip technology that will enable autonomous machines to see and sense the world. And this is critical because we are entering a new age of autonomy. By 2030, there will be an estimated 100 million self-driving vehicles and trucks driving us around and mobilizing our economy. And 20 million industrial robots will be packaging and delivering our products. And they all need a sensor called LiDAR to see the world. 
the way LiDAR works is by scanning a laser beam to build a 3D map of the local environment, enabling an autonomous machine to safely and efficiently navigate its surroundings. And the demand the LiDAR industry will need to meet is significant since the industry expects a $30 billion market for LiDAR sensors in the next decade. There are real world applications on the ground, on the road, and in the air. However, even though there has been significant investment over the past decade, through our customer interviews, we've discovered that LiDAR is still not good enough. So just like previous shifts in industry, where we have gone to the transistor that enabled computers as we know them, solid state drives that make our computers faster and more reliable, and silicon photonics that is accelerating our data centers, the world needs a solid state LiDAR on a chip technology that can meet the demands of the future. During our conversations with customers, multiple companies have told us that although there has been a lot of progress, LiDAR is still too expensive, it's unreliable and breaks down over time, and it's not scalable to the millions of units required by the industry. And there are several startups trying to solve this problem but they are still limited by their core technologies. They're not fully integrated. Some are still bulky. They are still expensive and have inadequate performance. There is still no proven long-term LiDAR solution. And so the Solyachich group has been set out to address these remaining issues with our LiDAR on a chip architecture. Our key innovation is an on-chip photonic lens design for optical beam steering. Here on the bottom left is a rendering of our first generation design. Using standard photonic components, we can feed a laser into a specially engineered lens and grating to steer a laser over a desired field of view. More recently, we've improved our design to have a 160 degree horizontal field of view, which is up to two times larger than other approaches. And this novel architecture is not just an idea. After three years of work at MIT and MIT Lincoln Laboratory, we've demonstrated a proof of concept. Using the eight inch wafer scale process at Lincoln Laboratory, we fabricated a demo that fits on a chip the size of a dime. Here on the bottom right are optical images of several components, including our switches, a lens, and a 32 port beam system. And as you can see from this next graphic, our lens can scan a laser over a wide field of view. And this enables our LiDAR on a chip platform to meet the demanding uh, industry requirements. We're fully solid state, which means it's low size, weight and power, reliable and, and robust. Uh, we can be produced at high volume with low cost, our sensors, have advanced sensing capabilities that can provide both range and velocity information. Our system is to, uh, immune to interference from the sun and other LIDAR. And we can meet the high performance demands on the ground, on the road and in the air with the wide field of view or long distance ranging, high resolution and random access scanning so we can quickly focus on regions of interest. And especially thanks to the Responde Center, we're now building a tabletop LiDAR engine that can detect up to 10 meters of ranging. And we have an 18 month roadmap that gets us to 100 meter ranging and beyond with a large field of view and alpha testing of a portable setup. And we're even looking further and finalizing our roadmap for a true minimum viable product that can meet all the industry demands. Our team is uniquely qualified to tackle this problem. Sam and I have been developing this technology over the past few years through our PhDs. And Tom Mahoney just graduated with a PhD in Course 6 and is an expert in novel laser, laser design. And our PI, Professor Marin Solicic, is a scientist and entrepreneur who has spun out three companies from our research lab. And so we would like to thank our collaborators and our supporters. And we'd like to thank you for taking the time to learn of how our 
LiDAR on a chip technology will enable autonomous machines to see the world. And we also ask you to join us during the breakout session if you want to learn more or feel free to email me at jjlopez at mit.edu. And thanks in advance for your questions and interest. Thank you very much, Hasue. And thank you to all of our speakers today um, who've done such a fantastic job and have been so you know, enthusiastic and informative. Um, in a few minutes, we're going to go to the breakout rooms where you can speak to the speakers in this last session. But before we do so, I, I have a few, you know, sort of, I'd say, closing remarks. Um, and certainly hope you've enjoyed IdeaStream today. You know, we started with a great panel, um, followed by fantastic speakers. Um, if you missed any of today's sessions or the panel, uh, we will have a recording up on our website in about a week of, of um, both yesterday and today's idea stream, and you can watch it then at your convenience. Also, um, if you can help any of our teams, please do so. Um, the panel spoke about the importance of building networks, collaborators, so any collaborations you can do with them, any introductions, um, whether the funding sources, team members, market participants would be fantastic. Um, any corporations that are interested in working more closely with us at the Dish Bundy Center and MIT, uh, please be in touch. If you like what we're doing and would like to support us financially and feel that this is a worthwhile cause, um, there's a link at the top of our um, homepage on the website uh, where you can click on that. It says give to the center. And, you know, we'd like to thank all of you for coming to IdeaStream, for being part of our community. Um, the way that innovation happens is not in isolation. It's all done by people. And it's really the community around us um, that supports the center and helps us. Um, and so we're now, we're going to the final breakout session. What we're not going to do at this session is we won't come back to the main stage. We'll just, you know, we'll just, when the breakouts are over, um, that'll be the end of IdeaStream. Um, for those of you that maybe came in late, missed the first sessions to get into a breakout, you go to the left of your hop-in screen, you click on breakout, you'll see a list of the rooms. You can jump between rooms if you want. Once you get into a room, um, to turn on your, your audio and video, you just go share audio and video, and that takes you into the discussion. Um, only 10 people can be live at a time, but there can be lots of people in the room listening to the discussion. You can also communicate with um, the speakers via the chat function. So please feel free um, to do that uh, and, and ask them any questions and offer you know, whatever support you can. And um, what I'd again like to thank you all for coming for spending time with us today. Uh, next year, we hope to see you in person and uh, stay safe. Uh, if you haven't yet had a vaccine, I hope you'll be able to get one fairly soon. And we're really looking forward to seeing everybody um, in person in the near future. So thank you very much.